As we continue, uh, we're now at the end of July, we continue our Bible studies in the Acts of the Apostles. I want to say, first of all, we had a very successful return to worship in church on Sunday in St. Luke's Mullet Glass, and that will continue 10 a.m. this Sunday, St. Luke's Mullet Glass. 11.30 this Sunday in Christ Church, uh, Bestbrook. And please turn up at least 15 minutes early for whichever service you are coming to. We would ask that Mullet Glass Prisoners Worship in Mullet Glass, Christ Church Prisoners Worship in Christ Church. Just until we get settled with uh, the limited number of people who can come into worship uh, regarding social distancing. There will also at 3.30 on Sunday, that's the 2nd of August I'm talking about, on th at 3.30 on Sunday, uh, there'll be a drive-in service once again at St. Luke's Ballymire in the rectory field. And please be there 15 minutes early so we can get you parked safely. Those have been going great guns. And even if you've been at church in the morning, come out again uh, and worship the Lord. You can at least sing sitting in your car, which we're not allowed to do yet in church. And so to our scripture, uh, to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. The context is, of course, in chapter 3, uh, Peter and John have healed, uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, a beggar who has been lame and is now able to walk. And they have given a robust uh, sermon. Peter has given a robust sermon as to... Uh, the purposes of this and so on and now there is a response chapter 4 of acts the priests and captain of the temple guard and the sadducees came up to peter and john while they were speaking to the people they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in jesus the resurrection of the dead they seized peter and john because it was evening they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day the rulers, elders and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them by what power or what name did you do this? When then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple, and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. So then, matters continue to escalate in Jerusalem. And first thing we need to notice is 
that the hierarchy respond very quickly, but in a very negative way. They were greatly disturbed because of what the apostles were teaching and proclaiming. Once again, I put the caveat, shorter this time, but just put the caveat, this is not uh, to be seen uh, in my view, and I think in the spirit of God, uh, as a, an anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish diatribe. Rather, this is a confrontation between people with vested interests in the hierarchy of institutionalized religion. And look here, I have been deeply implicated by the fact that I'm a clergyman in uh, the Church of Ireland. I am completely woven into a system, a hierarchy. I've played my part within that hierarchy. I have sat at the councils of church. Uh, indeed, doesn't that sound grand? No, it's not. It's boring as, and I can't use the term I want to use, it's just boring as. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it is interesting, though. There are people who live for this kind of stuff. I think there are good people who need to be in positions where they can do this stuff. But it's in every religion, it's in every institution, it's in every organisation. Human beings are hierarchical, we are organised, we like systems, and when things challenge systems, we don't like them. We don't like change very easily. Try to use the word change at a church planning meeting and see what happens next. Change is not a popular idea, and this is the most dynamic and you can, we always use the word dynamic as a positive, but this is the most dynamic, revolutionary, upsetting thing to come along in a very long time. Jesus himself has upset the apple cart in many ways. And so they thought with the crucifixion, with the conspiracy with the Romans, to have Jesus put to death, they thought that would settle matters. Now you and I know from Shakespeare, from watching The Sopranos, from watching The Godfather, from reading our, our novels, from drama and poetry and all these things. Very seldom do we settle all the matters. Very rarely do things go away. And they very rarely go away when there's a plot hatched and conspiracy takes place and wickedness is done. And a wickedness has been done. And it didn't go away. Because as he prophesied and as has been prophesied throughout scripture, Throughout the generations, Jesus is risen from the dead. That is our faith and that is what we proclaim and that is what is here before us. Because in verse 2, they, two, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Two things there and I'll take them the other way round to the way they are in this translation into the English First of all, they are proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. In this passage I have read that resurrection is mentioned twice and the crucifixion once. To listen to modern preaching, to listen to medieval preaching, and I don't know how far we would have to go back, you would think that only only aspect of the faith was the crucifixion. Of course you can't have resurrection without crucifixion, but it is the resurrection that they are proclaiming. It is the resurrection that is the central plank of everything they say in these early chapters. And that is as clear as clear as day. You crucified him, he is raised from the dead. Is the power punch. It's, it's the thing that gets it across very rapidly. The other thing, of course, is the primacy of the name of Jesus. That they were proclaiming and teaching in Jesus the resurrection. And I know I bang this drum all the time. When Jesus is not at the centre of church, when Jesus is not at the centre of our dealings with the faith, when Jesus is not the central thought, the central motivation, the central driving force, our, our place of meditation, our place of prayer, when Jesus is not at the, the centre, then things drift. They may not drift terribly far, but drift is drift. I'll, I'll give you a couple of analogies, one from modern technology, if I take a photograph on my uh, smartphone and I want to edit the photograph, I can move it about so that, you know, I can get the horizontal, I can make mountains stand on their sides and so on and so forth. Normally speaking, you want it to come into the, the plane, you want it to come into the true. 
And the slightest little nudge knocks it off true. And the slightest little nudge, when we nudge ourselves away from Jesus being right at the forefront of our thinking, then we start to pursue other things. They may not be bad in themselves, but we begin to, to drift away from Jesus. The others are more sinister sounding thing. But if you aim a gun, you aim a rifle or a, a, a any sort of gun at something, uh, and your target, paper target, okay, your target, <laughs> we're not assassins, uh, is just there in front of you, if you drift slightly a quarter uh, of an inch to the left, well then it doesn't make much difference. But if your target is a hundred meters away and you drift a quarter of an inch, you're going to miss the target. Because a little small drift here is a great big drift out there. And in the long term, another analogy could be that thing that gets in and rubs. And the oyster, it eventually becomes a pearl. Which the oyster is probably the most awful thing to happen. I don't know. The oysters have awful things happening to them. We could get very uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy about that, couldn't we? But <laughs> upset oysters with pearls. Uh, calm down, Alan. You know, so I've just had my lunch. I've probably too much sugar in my system. So <laughs> you have, and it's terrible, you can sit and talk to yourself and start laughing. Though Anne says I can do that quite easily. So, whatever it is that rubs and rubs and rubs, it causes a blister. Or whatever it is that causes an irritation. It can be a tiniest little thing at first. But you don't take it out and address it. It can become a big thing. And it's the same with the centrality of Jesus. Everything but everything gets put in the place of Jesus. The traditions of the church. And we can say, oh yes, look what happened in the medieval church and the traditions of the church. You try moving a Christmas tree from one side of a church to another and see what happens. Arr, that Christmas tree was there when my granda was in the church. Probably wasn't. We've only been bringing Christmas trees into church for a fairly short period of time. Christmas trees up the church tower. Flags. Pool. Big issue. You know, move something. Put something in a different place. And people prick up and look because it's changed. But it's because the things that we do have become centralized in the place of Jesus. And we've got to be very careful. Our favorite theologies, our favorite doctrines, uh, are the things that we go on about. And it can even be the ministry of healing. It can be any number of other things. Jesus, it, his name is always to the forefront of what Peter is saying. They seized Peter and John because it was evening. They put them in jail until the next day. The first account of followers of Jesus being banged up for their faith. This is something that has been the common experience of Christians throughout all generations. They put them in jail until the next day, but many who heard the message believed. So it was too late. We've had what happened at Pentecost and a huge number of people came to faith on the day of Pentecost. This is some time later. And wait till you hear this. Many who heard the message believed. And the number of men grew to about 5,000. 5,000 believers in Christ now. On top of however many it was. I should have done my, my homework better. So that I, could, I could look at it quickly. But you know, 5 Sorry, 3,000 people believed on the day of Pentecost. It's just here on that page. And I'm on this page over here. That's how long it has taken me to go from there to there. Okay, 3,000. That's 8,000 followers of Jesus in these first, this first week after Pentecost. Something big is happening. 8,000 believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Now again, I'll give you an example of how this becomes an obsession. There's an... There was a movement, uh, I'm not sure when it started, I encountered it in the mid-1980s, called the Church Growth Movement. And they said, look, the Acts of the Apostles are not afraid of statistics. And of course, they did great analytical work and they gave us great studies and great stuff to go on, but it became their obsession. And, and the obsession of the Church Growth Movement has become the obsession of the whole church. It actually has permeated its way Throughout the whole of the church, grow, 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 grow. When actually we're called to faithfulness. Growth's a great thing, but we're called to faithfulness. But 5,000 people have responded, what to? 
to the proclamation of Jesus and the healing of the sick and the declaration of the importance of resurrection. The next day, the rulers and elders and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. So were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? And religion can become very arid. Religion can become a very dry wilderness experience. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the sort of religion I grew up with, which is liturgical religion, which to some people I know seems a foreign land, and not just a foreign land, but a desert wasteland to some people. I can assure you it is not, uh, but it, it, uh, it can seem that to some people. But any form of religious experience, anything, can become a dry place. And, you know, by what power? They had no experience of the powerful intervention of God in their lives. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, There's something about life in the Spirit. There's something about as Paul calls it, keeping in step with the Spirit, is like the sea, like a river, like the breeze. It comes and it goes. It ebbs and it flows. It blusters and it storms. It's gentle and it's wickedly fast. Wicked, used in the wrong sense, of course. But, you know, it, it, all sorts of dimensions. And he's filled at this point. And he's filled, Why? Not so that Peter can look like a great man and say to the world, world, look, I was filled with the Holy Spirit on that day, but rather that God's will may be done and Jesus may be proclaimed. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to the rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness, there's a dig in that, isn't there? Shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The prominence, the preeminence, the centrality of the ministry of the apostles is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Just a side note, in case you are in any doubt, Jesus really was dead. And it was God who had to raise him from the dead. And it is by the name of Jesus whom you crucified that this man and God raised, he is healed. He says that Jesus is the stone you builders rejected or the capstone or cornerstone. That is a quotation from Psalm 118. So he proficiently uses the scripture that is known to them. They would know from their cycles of practice, their reading, their studying, their education, their faith journey, they would know this term. And he is saying, he's taking this scripture with which they are familiar and saying, this is what this means. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected. And now they have a prof found statement and you'll see this on billboards you'll see this on gable ends you'll see this on tracts and it is right at the start of the faith and it holds true today salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given by which men by which we must be saved by which we must be rescued by which we must be set free by which we must be redeemed from the tyrannies of this world the tyrannies that bind us and tie us down, the tyranny of sin, the tyranny of disobedience, and all other things that, that hold us down and keep us separated from God. Salvation is found in no other name. This is a profound statement. This is as different from the traditional Judaism espoused by these men before him. And again I say, it's not anti-Jewish. To have the theological interaction. Now, Peter's interacting with a fair bit of force, uh, but he, he is 
deeply committed and has a deep, deep understanding of this. What about that verse? Salvation is found in no one else. Okay. I am uh, no longer to be identified with a party view that would say that I am an evangelical. I am an evangelical, but I am not a party evangelical. I do not, therefore, accept many of the doctrinal positions that I was indoctrinated into and allowed myself to, to be led astray in my thinking. Personally, I believe, and I hope I can establish this through my teaching, I believe that all people are redeemed in Christ. I do not believe all religion leads to God in the same way. I do believe that Jesus is the only name given under heaven. But I believe that, as Jesus himself says in John's Gospel, now is the time of judgment, that the judgment has been visited upon sin and the sin of the world at the cross. Now, there may be people who are going to phone me up and get upset with me about that, but I do believe, along with the, the teachers of the early church, including Origen, uh, thought to be perhaps the finest theologian of the first 500 years of the church, that, you know, everyone is included in the love of God because for God to lose anyone is a failure and the ministry of Jesus cannot fail. It is in the name of Jesus, it is by the... Uh, crucifixion, the incarnation, crucifixion, death, resurrection of Jesus, that humanity is saved. But I believe that that's the case. That does not run contrary to this. If I was to give you a universalism that says every religion is the same as every other religion uh, and all of them lead to God, well, I would probably leave the Christian church. I could become a very liberal uh, Christian, but I, I, would, I would espouse a different philosophy and maybe become a member of the Baha'i faith or, or, or something similar. I believe that all people are called into God's grace and forgiveness, but it is because of Jesus. That is my firm belief. It is because of Jesus. He is central. He is God's big plan. And, you know, it's only in the last 200 years that we've been hammered into this position, hammered into this position, where we're on the defense of all the time, that to say the things I've just said, you know, uh, seems heresy and there will be people who say it's heresy it's not it was the held faith of the holy catholic and apostolic church right at the very beginning and i hold it today salvation is found in no one else absolutely for there is no other name under heaven given by which men must be saved absolutely it's in god's grace wisdom and mystery that these things come to pass when they saw the courage of peter and john and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Okay, these men were unschooled ordinary men. That does not mean we take delight in being unschooled and ignorant in our faith. Uh, there are those who hold a strange uh, negative uh, belief that, oh, those guys, they go and study theology and they, they learn this and they learn that. And I'm as good as anybody else. Of course you're as good as anybody else. Now, this was a particular set of circumstances, and they could see these are fishermen from Galilee. They knew their tongue. They had an accent, like I've got an accent. They had a way about them. Uh, they were provincial people, and they knew that. And you cannot, you know the old saying, you can take Lurgan out of the boy. You, you can take the boy out of Lurgan, but you can't take Lurgan out of the boy. Or whatever it is, you know, you can take them out of Galilee, but it was there. You can take them out of the fishing boat, but it was there. And they could see this, but... They speak with authority. They speak with authority. There's the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that, that was upon Jesus. And people looked at Jesus and said, where does he get this authority? The same thing. Filled with the Holy Spirit, remember? Filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter proclaimed to them, this Jesus whom you crucified and God raised from the dead, it is in his name that we have done this thing. They're ordinary men and they are astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. It is noteworthy when we spend time with Jesus. It makes a difference. It changes. It transforms us when we spend time with Jesus. And since they could see that the man who was healed was standing there beside them, there was nothing they could say. What is the role of the miracle? It's to give evidence of what is being said. 
The greatest miracle is the transforming life. The greatest miracle is that the ordinary men are now different. Well, there's this ministry of signs and wonders that we see in the New Testament, and there it is. It's evidence. He's there. You can't deny it. They would have known him. They were in and out of the temple all the time. They knew who he was. They had seen it. They knew this had happened and that there was truth in what was being said. There was veracity to it. And they, they knew there was nothing they could say. So the best they could do was to tell him to withdraw. They had a confab and they said, Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. So they weren't in the position to be cynical. They weren't in the position to say this hasn't happened. They weren't in a position to do any of that. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Now look, if you have been transformed by Jesus, if you have been touched by the grace and love of God, be it ever so calmly, be it ever so peacefully, be it ever so privately, you cannot help but share this great good news. This great thing that has happened. So they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So they recognized that preaching in the name of Jesus is the key thing. They've got to shut that down. Shut it up. Be quiet. Do not speak in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And if we know the wonder of God's grace and love, we cannot help speaking about it. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them, because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Again, I'll start at the back again. We've got to think in terms of uh, life expectancy. 40 year old man, uh, at AD, in the year AD 30, 40 year old man was doing all right. He was doing quite well uh, because of so many things you could die of at an early age. He was doing well at the age of uh, 40. And it, it, this wasn't some young fella, this was somebody. And there had also been a long time for him to have been seen there. Okay, so people knew about him. So they threatened to punish them, uh, but they did, couldn't decide how to do it because all the people were praising God. You've 3,000 people come to faith on Pentecost. You've further 5,000. You've 5,000 new committed followers. We know that Jesus appeared to 500 uh, between the resurrection and ascension. So you now have 5,500 accounted for people. And there were other people around. 5,500 people. Jerusalem was not a big place in those days. And they are all praising God. And it says the whole city is praising God. Everybody's praising God. And we know from what happened to Jesus how fickle a crowd can be. We know from the, the life and, uh, and ministry of Moses how they're going to be cheering Moses at one minute and turning on Moses the next. We know this is human nature. But in this moment, these guys are afraid of the crowd. There's an echo there of Monday, Thursday night into Good Friday morning, isn't there? Fear of the crowd. What will the crowd say? And populism can work for you or against you. And populism is very much at the fore here okay so the whole place is an uproar when the whole place gets an uproar in the church of Jesus Christ we who are involved in the institutions of the church get very like these men we get very shaky about it uh, and we can get very upset about it and we can even conspire against it let us keep in step with the spirit let us learn from this life and ministry of Peter and John and the other apostles. Central to everything it is Jesus. Jesus and always Jesus. 
Lord, open my heart to your word and your word to my heart. In the name of Jesus, amen. Father of all, we come to you at this time of great uncertainty, anxiety, pestilence, and fear. We pray at a time when people seem to be becoming, in our country and other parts of the world, very careless of the threat of COVID-19. And we pray, Lord, for wisdom individually, communally, and at government level. We pray for your wisdom to abound in all the world. Be with the sick and the dying, O Lord. Bring comfort, bring healing, bring peace. Be with those who grieve. Be with those who have lost loved ones. And be with us all at this time. As we come back to church to worship, help us to be wise. Help us to show common sense and good judgment in all that we do. And in the ministry, mission and life of your church and all the world, May we always, always keep the name of Jesus to the forefront of our theology, our practice, our doctrine, our worship, our liturgies. If we use not liturgies, our forms of worship, our gatherings, our studies, our reflections, our meditations, Jesus, be my all. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let's gather slowly. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.